Okay, you peanut butter lovers. <laughs> Did anyone have, say, peanut butter and jam? Just, uh, it's, a, it's not just me, is it? Yeah, there's, there's a small handful of people. That's good to know. It's good to know. Hey, it's such a joy um, for Beth and I to be here today, and a double joy to witness some baptisms today as well. Excellent. It's, it's actually quite funny speaking here, and you've got the pool just there. Um, you know, you kind of have these thoughts come through your mind. Do you have this, that things can go wrong? And, and, and for some reason, I kind of get excited and trip over and fall in there, but I don't want to do that. So um, I'm going to pray. Um, let's pray. Let's commit this time to the Lord. Father God, what an awesome time to be here, Lord, with your family once again, uh, to witness these baptisms taking place, to come together as one and worship you, almighty God, and to thank you for your son, Jesus, who is our savior. And we thank you for the opportunity to be able to listen to your word. May your spirit teach us and guide us, Lord. May your word be our rule in life, your spirit our teacher, and your supreme glory our greatest concern. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we are continuing in your series through the book of Amos, and then when I have finished, it will be time for baptisms. Um, those who are being baptized, just listen out to what I'm sharing today because I'm going to draw um, a, a lesson to your attention. It's for all of us, but I kind of feel before the Lord, it's a message especially for you today as well. And for those who've been going along in the book of Amos, you might be thinking, what on earth um, can we get a, a message out of that concerning us today, concerning us in following Jesus? Well, wait and see. So the title is Accountability and Hope, and we're zeroing in on chapter 4 today. And the message, the title to the message I have given it is Prepare to Meet Your God. And that's actually a phrase from verse 12 of Amos chapter 4. And in your series, for those who are regular attenders here, who've been following uh, through this series of Amos, you'll remember that Amos the prophet, he prophesied during the time when Jeroboam II was king over the northern kingdom of Israel, and Uzziah was king of Judah, which was the southern part of Israel at that time. And it could be described as this. Um, the, the people at that time were experiencing success in many ways, both politically, uh, as mi military powers, and in many other ways as well. They were excelling in those things. However, they were also, though, unfortunately, excelling in things that one should not be proud of. Things like idolatry, wealthy indulgence, immorality, corruption, and oppression of the poor. These things were happening as well. And the job of Amos the prophet was to warn the folks, hey guys, wake up, get out of that. You don't want to be doing that kind of stuff because you are inviting upon yourself the judgment of God. Don't do that. And that was Amos's role as the prophet at that time. He was prophesying to a people who have been described as polit politically secure and spiritually smug. In fact, their, st their status was summarized to me 40 years ago when I was a student at um, Assembly Bible School in 1983. And my lecturer through the Minor Prophets was Doug Hewlett. And some of the older ones will remember Doug Hewlett, the Bible teacher of that time. And he took us through the Minor Prophets, and he got us to summarize the essence of the message of each of the minor books of the Minor Prophets. I've never forgotten it. Amos, affluent arrogance. Affluent arrogance. I mean, it was handy when you did exams as well to remember all the the themes of all the books, but um, Hosea, heartbroken husband, Joel, jumpy judgments. They're just little things that, that remind us of the essence of the message of the minor prophets. 
So we're going to read the, uh, the text, Amos chapter 4. If you've got a Bible, Bible app, follow along with me. Um, in light of this, I'm going to use the words of C.H. Spurgeon. Let's release the lion from out of the cage. So often, he said in his time, people were trying to defend the Bible. And Spurgeon said, just read it and expound it. Let the lion out. He's quite capable of defending himself. Thank you very much. So I'm going to do that. Chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria. You women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness, the time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. You will each go straight out through breaches in the wall, and you will be cast out toward Harmon, declares the Lord. Go to Bethel and sin, go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years, Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Yet, you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards, destroying them with blight and mildew, Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees, yet you have not, to me, says, oh, you Auckland people are shy. I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword even, along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet, let's all say together, Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what I'll do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God. He who forms the mountains, who creates the wind and who reveals his thoughts to mankind, who turns dawn to darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. May God bless the reading of his word. I wonder if anyone knows the name of that bird. Close. It's the bar-tailed godwit. And it's a little bird, well, I think reasonably small, that does a round trip every year from Alaska to New Zealand and back again. It travels 24,000 kilometers every year. I think it's pretty amazing. A reasonably small bird hitting a reasonably small island, bottom of the world, us, Every year, it doesn't miss. I mean, if it did, it would go to the Antarctic, you know, breed with penguins or whatever. I don't know what it would do. But it doesn't miss. It never misses New Zealand. It's got this, this homing of ice that, 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 that's wired into it that always points it to New Zealand. And to me, it's a picture of this longing that every one of us has, a longing for God that God has placed in our hearts. It's like a bird's homing instinct. It's pointing us homeward to be with God, and we are restless and unfulfilled until we do so. And the point is, 
looking at our passage today, are we prepared to meet with God? And what kind of reception will that be for each one of us? So we're going to learn from the failures that the people made in Amos' time. We're going to listen to the invisible God who speaks audibly through Amos the prophet to see how we best prepare to meet with our God. And the very first failure that comes up of the people of that time in verses 1 to 3 is that they failed to care, especially for those who were in need. Verse 1 starts, you can see it in your own text. Hear this word. That's come up before in your series. Verse 2, the sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness. Now, with such introductions, we know that that which is about to be said is pretty serious indeed. And then we have the phrase, hear this word, you cows of Bashan. Is he preaching to cows? Now, Bashan was a prosperous farming area east of the Jordan River, and it was famous for its productivity. And here Amos likens the woman of Samaria to the cows of Bashan. The point is, well fed, but at what cost? And that's the key to this phrase in, in verses 1 to 2. What was the cost? It tells us in verse 1, you oppress the poor and you crush the needy. The focus is here is on a society that was rich to the point of indulgence. And it was at the, the cost of the poor. They oppressed the poor. It's a picture of a society that was wallowing in self-indulgence at the expense of the poor. And this was a deadly serious charge before the eyes of God. In fact, you see in verse 2 of chapter 4, you will be taken away. He says to the indulgent wealthy, wealthy at the expense of the poor, you will be taken away. And history tells us that they were taken away, literally as captives, to the Assyrians in 721 BC. And the Assyrians had a ferocious reputation for being cruel. They were cruel to their captors. And this is a, a copy of rock drawings of the time in terms of the Assyrians. Um, they took their prisoners of war. They would lead them away with ropes fastened to hooks. And the hooks pierced the nose or lower lips of the captives. These people were incredibly cruel. The Assyrians. But God was going to allow them to come and take those wealthy Israelites away into captive because of their sin. The point is that the prosperous Israelites had treated the poor amongst them as animals. Now they in turn were going to be treated as animals by the Assyrians. There are serious consequences for the way that they lived their lives at the expense of the poor. And so we're told, verse 2, they crushed the needy and the poor. Okay, what can we get from this? Folks, we want to be caring and compassionate people. We don't want to have a reputation of being self-indulgent at the expense of the poor. We don't want to be cruel to people. We want to be caring and compassionate, especially to those who are in need. And then we see a second failure. It's there in verses 4 to 5. They failed to worship God in a way that was honoring to God. So verse 4. Now, to, to understand this, you've got to realize verses 4 and 5 are just full of irony and sarcasm. Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. The prophet's focusing on their religious life. 
And this biting irony is Amos exposes their fake religion. Very sarcastic words. The words of verses 4 and 5 are the call of a priest to come and worship. Come and worship. But in sarcasm, come and worship in order to sin. Come and do the very things that are detestable to the Lord. Oh, yes, do your religious activities. Look the part. Bethel and Gilgal were sacred places of worship. And Bethel was associated with Jacob in Genesis 28. Jacob's ladder, so-called. That story. And Gilgal was associated with Joshua when he brought the Israelites across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And they set up a, a monument there of stones. It was, a, it, was a, it was a sacred place in the history of Israel. And both these places, Bethel and Gilgal, became uh, places of worship. In Amos's day. You know the irony continues. Verses 4 and 5. Bring your sacrifices every morning. Bring your special tithes. Brag about your free will offerings. Their worship had become a mockery. An exercise in self-congratulation. People were bra bragging about their contributions. Oh how much did you give to the Lord this Sunday? Well I gave this, this. And you? Oh, well, I gave this, this, my car, my house. Yeah, yeah. There was this nonsense that was going on, this bragging. Their worship had become self-satisfying rather than God-glorifying. Can you note that? Their worship had become self-satisfying rather than God-glorifying. So on the one hand, the problem with Israel, it was, it was pretending to be religious. And yet on the other hand, they were pursuing a glamorous and indulgent lifestyle at the expense of the poor. What do we learn? Folks, we want to be true worshippers of God. We want to worship from our hearts sincerely with a love for God, overwhelmed at the love he has poured abundantly upon us. In the person of his son, Jesus Christ. We want to be genuine, sincere worshippers of God. And then we see yet another failure of the people of that time. Verses 6 to 11. They failed to remember. They failed to remember the, the events of the past. They failed to learn from the mistakes of the past. And in these verses, verses 6 to 11... You, you, you get the personal pronoun I, so it's as if the Lord is speaking to them directly. And it's he reminding them of the discipline, actions that he had done to the people of Israel in order to cause them to turn back to him, to repent from their sinful ways. So you see in those words, I gave you empty stomachs. I withheld rain. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another I struck your gardens and vineyards with blight and mildew. I sent plagues. I, I even had to kill some of your young men. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps. I overthrew you eight times. That personal pronoun, I, is used. As God was trying to slap his people in the face to wake them up. Come back to me. Repent. From your wicked, wicked ways. And turn back to me. And five times we read in that passage, and I tried to get you involved, which you warmed up to. Five times they responded. Well, the prophet responded. Yet you did not return to me. They were stubborn. They were rebellious. And they had forgotten the lessons of the past of how God had dealt with them in the past. They had forgotten their responsibilities of the covenant relationship that they were a part of. So previously, God had judged them in a way, in a way disciplining them, just as a loving parent disciplines your child. You know, sometimes you've got to be a little bit firm so that your children know what is right 
and what is wrong. And God, our Heavenly Father, He was dealing with His people in that way. But the Israelites had got to such a stage of hardness of heart and of wickedness and of refusal to repent that they were going to be judged. They were just as bad as the pagan nations around them. Sin was so deeply ingrained within them that they were not even aware of it. Ouch. I wonder if that's been our experience at times. When sin has been so deeply ingrained within us, we don't even see it. We're not aware of it. And so judgment was inevitable. What can we take from this? Oh, folks, we want to learn. We want to learn from the past, from the mistakes that we have made in our lives. Learn from them. And learn from the past in terms of what the Bible teaches us of how God deals and works with his people. We want to be learning learning all the time. And probably this fourth and final one really sums up the lack of relationship between God's people and the Lord God Almighty himself. Verses 12 to 13, they failed to engage with God. And so we have in verse 12, you know, that, that, that statement, the, the, the title to the message today, prepare to meet your God. And in these final two verses, we have an example of what true worship is all about. There's a big irony here in that the Israelites refused to have a relationship with their Lord, their Lord God Almighty. Wow. There's going to come a time when God is going to engage with them. But it will be a time of judgment. Who is this God? Verse 13. Let me read it to you again. Verse 13. He who forms the mountains, who creates the wind, and who reveals his thoughts to mankind, who turns dawn to darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. Folks, this is your God. And here is an example of true worship when we focus upon the Lord as described in verse 12. It, it's it's a, a rich and powerful reminder of who God truly is. You see the transcendence of God that is described in those words. He treads on the heights of the earth. The one who is up there, the almighty one, the sovereign one, the creator of all. That's his transcendence. But you see the imminence as well of our awesome God who reveals his thoughts to mankind. There's a personal, intimate level as well. This awesome, transcendent one knows you. He knows me. And he shares his thoughts at a personal, intimate level with you and I even today. This is the God that we worship. And we need to bow in awe before him. And in fact, such a revelation of God must, dear friends, draw out from us a response, if necessary, of repentance. And of faith, which leads to a change of life, a transformed life that is governed by a passion for God and compassion for people. And that is our response. It is to be our response of worship to God today. And I just want to just mention... Um, Probably comes as a forewarning that your time is coming soon, oh, baptized, soon to be baptized ones. But I, I, I want this part. And Abby, Samuel, and Claudia, just, I'm, 
You all see your faces to me. Can you just raise your hand? One, two. And Claudia. There. So I I, I don't know if I've met you, Claudia, but are you Michael's sister? Yeah. That's okay. (laughs) This is, I I really felt in preparing this, this is for everyone. Oh, man, this is a much-needed message. But for you in particular, because you're doing a key thing today in terms of your walk with Jesus. You're pointing your face in the right direction. But the life that you live from now on needs to be governed, motivated, and led by a passion for God and compassion for people. A passion for God and compassion for people. And it's that which prepares us for our meeting with God in the future. So that that meeting that we will face with God in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, will not be one of judgment as the people of Israel were going to face in Amos' time. It won't be a meeting of fear and trepidation, but rather of joy and of our longing for God that is fulfilled when we meet him face to face, when we'll be able to truly say, I am home. I am truly home when I am with my God face to face. And just a closing thought for everyone here today. Some Bible commentators liken the state of the people of Israel in the time of Amos to the state of the church at Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. The church there was, had a reputation to be that it was a sophisticated church. It was located in one of the richest commercial centers of the ancient world. In fact, uh, William Barclay, who, whose specialty was the first century history, and particularly of the Greco-Roman world, made this comment. The Laodiceans were so well off that they needed help neither from man nor God. They were so self-sufficient, smug like the people of Israel in Amos's time. They'd put their trust in material prosperity, in outward luxury, in commercial success, and in physical health. And such a mindset had infiltrated the church so much that they earned in this passage in Revelation 3 a strong rebuke from the Lord. The church was seen as outwardly prosperous. But when you read this passage in your time, you will see that spiritually the church was poor, blind, and naked and didn't even know it. it, Didn't even realize it. It was described as lukewarm. A bit like that water, perhaps. Neither hot nor cold. Neither one thing nor the other. It was a failure on both accounts. And our Lord's response was to this lukewarm church was quite a significant response. He was sickened by the ineffectiveness of a self-satisfied church. A complacent church. One that was spiritually smug. One that trusted in riches rather than God. And such an attitude leads to judgment. Such an attitude leads to judgment. So as we continue to go through the series in the book of Amos, put yourself in the place of those Israelites and the church at Laodicea and listen to God's message. Ask yourselves the questions as I have asked myself and been convicted in preparing for this today. Have you grown complacent? Have other concerns taken God's place in your life? Do you ignore those who are poor and or in need? 
And the way we respond to those questions determines the nature of God's response to us when that day comes when we meet him in the future. But I finish with the statement, there is hope. Because you know from Revelation 3, verses 19 and 20, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me.